Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Introduce a wonderful lady, and and some of you know her, and those who don't, you're in for a real treat. I'd like to present Geraldine. Come on, Geraldine, get up. Good morning. And it is a beautiful morning. And when I get off of here, it'll be more beautiful. In all these years, I have never gotten used to talking, and if you get tired of listening before I get tired of talking, you can either raise your hand or leave the room, and I couldn't care less. Uh, <laughs> my name is Jerry I'm an alcoholic and an addict. I've been at it a long time, and I... Uh, I wasn't an alcoholic when I came to AA. I want you to know that you people made me alcoholic. (laughs) I just want to know who to blame it on, and I can blame it on this whole room. Because you did it, not me. You see, I had problems. You just don't understand. When I was young, I had problems. I had a mother... Uh, who had a bad gallbladder uh, mm, caused by alcohol. But nice ladies didn't drink in those days, and Verna was a closet drinker. And the doctor was very helpful, just as the doctors are today. And uh, (laughs) they came to see Verna when she had a gallbladder attack. Verna was throwing up, and Verna got the new drug on the market, heroin. And then Verna was out to the church social right after. (laughs) You see, she was the wife of the bank president, and Geraldine was the naughty girl. And Geraldine was only called Geraldine when she was naughty, which was most of the time. And uh, uh, Geraldine's father drank a little bit, but for a hard-shell Baptist in the Bible Belt to ever get drunk was unheard of, and he got drunk twice in his life, six days at a time, and uh, (laughs) of course that wasn't much, but you know that's better than none. And then uh, uh, Geraldine uh, went away to school and she became very successful, and uh, she went up rapidly in the... uh, health field and was one spoiled rotten kid just like she was before nothing new nothing had changed and I had the opportunity of traveling the United States over eight months out of the year for 20 years with a group of doctors and um, I traveled the fast track somebody wanted to know if I ever got in trouble drinking during that time and I said well not much It seems that about 49 years ago, the head of a very large children's hospital and I got drunk in Boston, and um, we came back and we heard nice music, and in those days they had terrace ballrooms, and uh, we tripped down to respond to the nice music. Doesn't everybody respond to nice music? Well, we were a little drunk, and we were invited to leave the floor, and we declined, and uh, it seems that the cops came in and got us, and we had crashed a full-dress debutante ball 49 years ago in Boston, and uh, one does not do that if they're a woman, but one did. Uh, I still assume that I'm a woman, and I like being a woman. I always liked men better than women ever since I found out they were different, and I suppose you girls join me. Uh, Life went on, and I was protected, unfortunately, by all the people, the doctors all over the country. And I did work hard, there wasn't any doubt about it, but I was having um, relapses of tiredness. And they would put me in a psychiatric hospital with nurses around the clock, Uh, 22 of them to be exact. 
Uh, and they came up with very nice diagnosis. Uh, you know, I was outrageously overworked and underpaid. And I did work hard, but I was the best paid woman in the United States. And um, they just uh, thought um, that really uh, I deserved a rest. And they would shape me up and I would ship out and start all over again. And uh, no one ever saw me drink. Um, I wanted to be popular when I was a little younger. You see, booze was the illegal drug. And all of these new drugs, phenobarbital, secondol, alanol, all this stuff were coming in like crazy. And we had a sample closet at the office. And uh, the doctors would say, we'll try the new medicine on Jerry, and if it doesn't kill her, it won't hurt the patients. <laughs> And uh, um, time went on until finally the 23rd psychiatrist that saw me, um, he was a very nice man. He saw me every day for three months. Now, understand I didn't have to pay for any of this. You understand that. <laughs> uh, I'd have never gone to psychiatrist one if I'd have had to pay for it. Uh, but uh, he saw me every day for three months. Saturdays and Sundays included. And he came up with a great diagnosis that I was truly overworked and underpaid and they should do something about it. And they decided to put me on a year's leave of absence with full pay and all benefits. But they wrote me about it. They didn't have the guts to face me. Uh, you know, I'm known as a tough character around the country. I'm the toughest of the lot. Uh, the kids now call me Grambo, not Rambo. <laughs> Grambo. And I didn't like the way they wrote it. And I told them what they could do with their job. You know, thinking they'd say, oh, now, Jerry, don't get so upset. What they said was, bye-bye. And I lost this job of 20 years standing. The best thing that ever happened to me, except that when my father went broke, I learned to work and work hard. 1927, he went down to the bottom. And I remember the first dress I earned the money for, 10 cents at a time. And you know, girls, if I had that dress right now, I could wear it. Uh, because it had pleats on the bottom, you know, and a long jacket and all that stuff. And I saved 10 cents at a time in a milk bottle to get that dress. And it's the only dress I remember. My girlfriend got a pink one, and I got a purple one, just alike, pleats on the bottom, velvet jacket, you know. And we thought we looked beautiful, and frankly, I think we looked like a couple of State Street whores. Uh, <laughs> but we didn't know the difference, and that's what we're wearing now, pleats on the bottom and long jackets on there. Things go round, but not too far. And uh, time went on, and they gave me um, a discharge, and they gave me a five-figure bonus, which was unbelievable in those days, and sent me on my way. Where was my way? I don't know. I don't know where I went for six months. Now, in the past, you would have thought I wouldn't get into this because I had a problem in my life. I had a moral leper brother who drank too much. Oh, he was terrible. Why, he came home drunk night after night after night. And what he needed was a child psychiatrist because he just hadn't grown up. There was one child psychiatrist on the eastern seaboard, Dr. James Plant, and I called him up and I said, Jim, 
What do you do with a moral leper brother who drinks too much? He said, Jerry, I don't know. He said, now wait a minute. I went to a medical meeting the other night, and there was a guy there talking by the name of Bill Wilson. He said, he's doing something peculiar with men who drink too much. Not women, men who drink too much. He said he gave me his card, I'll call him up. And he called our beloved Bill up. And Bill and two other guys came out from New York to Maplewood, New Jersey, 49 years ago, to see my brother. And I'm grateful to tell you that he stayed sober until his death a few years ago. His sobriety should have brought me more than it did. But they say a little something about alcoholics being arrogant. I don't know, I've heard that someplace. <laughs> and let me tell you something. I was arrogant. They took me to meetings and I thought it was a nice little club for those moral leper drunks. I'm very grateful today to the non-alcoholic women who didn't treat me like a moral leper then or later. They didn't argue with me and neither did the old time AA people. They took me to meetings. Along the way, my brother began to have a problem was that sister of his that was waking up in hospitals all over every place. And they invited him to come and see me, and he declined. <laughs> After I got the bonus and started on that last tour, he began to be nervous about it. One night, he got a call that I was in a nut, in a nut house on the west side of Chicago. I don't even know the name or where it was to this very day. <clears throat> he knew it was a lockup. And somehow or other, he knew that that was the time. He had to borrow money from his AA friends. And that wasn't easy for him because he had very little income. But he decided that was the time. It took me 20 years to tell him or anybody else how I got in that nut house. It seems that I had gone dancing with a few doctors at a nightclub in Chicago and decided to do a strip tease. <laughs> And they didn't think it would look well on the front page of the Tribune for someone with a national reputation to be strip-teasing. I don't know why. They're all for narrow-minded. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, that's how I got in the lockup. And you know when I wakened in the morning, they say there is a point beyond which God will not let us go. And that point came that morning because when I turned my head to the right there were bars on the window. To the left there was that peephole in the door. There were no doorknobs on. As one of the guys says, O'Keefe says, a sloppy architect. <laughs> and I knew right where I was. There was one chair, my clothes were draped over it. And for the first time in all those seven years, I said out loud, if I ever get out of here, <coughs> I'm going to help ask my brother if he'll help me, and I didn't call him a moral leper. And the first miracle of AA came to me 20 minutes later. 
He stepped off the elevator in that nut house in Chicago because he knew that that was the time. How did he know? God will tell us if we will listen. He'd been trying to tell me for a long time, but I wouldn't listen. But Oscar did. And there he was. And when the tears stopped, crocodile ones, he said, honey, you've made a pretty lousy mess out of your life. Do you want to do something about it? Well, I wanted to do something about it, but I didn't want to go with that bunch of holy rollers that were praying all the time. I didn't believe in God. But like all alcoholics, the greatest liars in the world, I said, yes, I want to do something about it with my fingers crossed behind me. <laughs> and he said, well, we'll have to go back east. I don't know whether my wife will take you in or not. You've been pretty brutal to her. Because when he was drinking, I supported them. But I made her pay through the nose for every dime I gave her. I was a rotten, nasty, mean Welshman. And they don't come any worse than that. The Irish are bad, but the Welsh are worse. <laughs> And so we went back east, and as luck would have it, the weather was bad, and we had to land out in Pennsylvania and drive down to Newark. And the hills are like this, and I'm 48 hours without anything after having been some 20 years on booze and 19 on drugs. You'd always mix them, don't you? Everybody mixes them. So, I'm a little nervous. And I'm a little sick at my stomach. But there was nothing on my stomach to come up. It'd all come. And we get down to Newark in that limousine. And he parks me in the lobby of a hotel. Now, girls, this was in an era when there were no permanents. And I had long hair then, and it was stringing. No makeup, stringing hair. And here I am sitting in the lobby of that hotel while he taught two classes at Rutgers. I'm dying, shaking, everything's wrong. So I made an important decision. I'm going to go in the ladies' room and fix up. And I'm going to go in the bar I'd never been, never had to ask anybody to buy me a drink, ever. But this was an important decision, and I went into the ladies' room and took one look in the mirror, and my dear friends, I have never forgotten that image to this day. It was horrible. String and hair. Plaster face, no lipstick. My face never fit together. In the beginning, I almost didn't come together, and instead of being grateful, I've always hated it. But you know, my nose goes cattywampus, and I got one ear up and one ear down. And uh, <laughs> now with all the trash they give us, we can come out looking fairly good, you know, you know, just like we're bound. <laughs> but then you didn't have anything. And here I am without a drink. And that image was so bad, I gave up asking anybody to buy me a drink. <laughs> and I sweat it out. And I waited until my brother came, and we went back for me to live at his house. His wife didn't want me. The kids sort of looked at me as much as to say, I wonder what happened to her. Nobody talked about alcohol in those days, you know. Neither did they ask you, dear, would you like to go to a meeting? They said, come on, we're going to a meeting. I don't feel like it. Who asked you if you felt like it? You drank every day, didn't you? 
So I went to meetings, and they were saying a lot of stupid things. And I wanted to correct them because you under, don't understand. I'm an intellectual. I'm so damn smart, I couldn't even keep the cork in the bottle. You know, any idiot can stop drinking. Uh, it's what you do after you stop. I stopped thousands of times, but I always started. That was my... But here I am, unable to get a drink, unable to get a pill, no money, still waving to everybody. <laughs> Couldn't sleep nights. They made me go to meetings, and I wanted to talk. You know how you let the new ones talk now? A little sawed-off sergeant about so high a fit right under my arm kept saying to me, Shut up! <laughs> Shut up! <laughs> to which I replied, I thought you could do A any way you wanted to. And that little sawed-off rump looked down his nose at me. And he said, You don't have a way. And he was right. I didn't. And I kept going to meetings. Terrible group. And I thought, well, gee, I, I got to do something about this. How in the name of God? Uh, I'm not alcoholic. Uh, anyone that's alcoholic uh, has a problem. And I didn't have any problem. My problem was not getting the alcohol. That was my problem. I didn't have any problem after I got it. They had the problems, not me. I was fine. But uh, um, I thought, well, I'll fix them. I had an advantage that none of you have had, I'm sure. Lois and Bill spent the weekends at our home in Maplewood where I was living with my brother. And I shall be forever grateful to Lois because she was so gentle with me, and she listened, and she said, give it time, give it time. While I was still drinking, I one time asked Bill, because I met Bill right after Oscar got sober 49 years ago, and I said, Bill, how do you work that thing? I had a habit of waving my hands. I wouldn't call it AA. How do you work that thing? Bill looked at me very quietly, hesitated quite a while, and he said, I'll tell you, Jerry, don't drink. Don't take those drugs. Go to meetings. And he hesitated a minute, and he said, and shut up. <laughs> you know, in our day, cocaine was over the counter in the tobacco store, and nothing but the cheap labor used cocaine to keep them awake. The drug to cure all everything was heroin. Weeds were over the counter. That's pot. But the Indians used weeds, and they were fighting with the North Americans who wanted to be an Indian. <laughs> Alcohol was illegal. We blew up houses with stills. And I became popular in my drinking days by running booze across the Canadian border. Now, I had a very unique way of carrying it. You see, I was very skinny in those days, and my legs sort of went like this, the, from the hips to the knees. And we would practice with water, two hot water bottles, and later we would fill it with booze, Canadian whiskey, strap it between our legs, tie it around the waist, 
And honey, when I went to the party with two quarts of Canadian booze, I was popular. (laughs) When I went to work for the medical profession, I was popular because I could get a a gallon tin of straight alcohol, 180 proof, and take it to the party. I got it for a dollar fifty nine cents, uh, and I was very popular, very popular. One day I t- tried bathtub gin. That's how my drinking started. Was bathtub gin. Now, do you know what bathtub gin is? It's straight alcohol, cut with a little water, a little juniper berry. Um, you let it age fifteen minutes. <laughs> You serve it in hard cider and with a handful of phenobarbital, which you carried around in your pocket, you fly right over the moon. <laughs> I always had the supply of alcohol and pills uh, uh, because the medication was coming on the market. Incidentally, people say, well, Bill Wilson never took any drugs there. Heck, he didn't. He was in Towns Hospital three times. I made it seven times. Um, Dr. Silkworth came to see him, and he took, he bought the message. Dr. Silkworth came to see me, and I wanted him to talk to me about my psychiatric problems. And he came to talk to me about my drinking, and I threw him out of the room. <laughs> And then I decided maybe I ought to have him come back, and uh, he declined. (laughs) So I have been rejected, you understand that. And Bill had had known us quite a while, and he he was very straightforward. He never pulled any punches. He was very quiet, and incidentally, at a later time, Before I got sober, my brother was being criticized for not going to enough meetings. And he went in New York to see Bill, made a special appointment and a special trip. To see Bill, to ask Bill how many meetings he should go to. Said, the boys are criticizing me. And Bill leaned back in his chair and put his hand behind his head and he said, well, Oscar... How many meetings do you want to go to to save your life? You drank every day, and that's all he said. That answers it. If you drink every day, you go to meetings every day. If you drank day and night, you go to meetings day and night. That's all. Over the the years... Over the first months, I should say, of my sobriety, if you want to call it that, my enforced abstinence, I saw things come through the walls, things crawl under the doors. I was afraid to tell anybody for fear they'd lock me up and they would have. I was having DTs, and I couldn't get away, and I didn't have any money. And finally it began to wear off. And let me tell you folks, if you've been mixing any kind of medication with your alcohol, give it time. Because it takes time. Dr. Ruth Fox, when I went to see her when I'd been sober about three years, famous psychiatrist that just died at age 93, and I said, Ruth, I don't seem to have as good a memory as I used to have. She said, be patient, Jerry. It takes two years to get your brains out of hock and three more to get them unscrambled, and then you begin to grow. (laughs) She's right. Thank God I didn't see myself all at one time. If I had, if I'd have gone out and gotten drunk. Because I knew I, I would have known I couldn't make it. I would have known I couldn't work. I would have known I had no brain. But I could dress, 
I finally got a job in one of the hospitals that didn't have sense enough to know that I was half wacky. Um, and I got some money. And I thought, I'll show these folks. I'll memorize these 12 steps and I'll talk the talk. And underneath my breath, I won't walk the walk. Because I don't want to be like them. And I memorized the 12 steps and I talked the talk. And I saved my money. And along about eight months, I decided, I'm fine now. I will go back to Chicago and join my friends and drink like a lady. Never wanted to be anything but a lady. And I bought a ticket, and I packed my bags and hid them, and I had it all set up for a Monday morning after my brother and sister-in-law went to work. I was running away. If you don't think there aren't miracles today, you're looking at one now. Because I had it planned down to the last letter. But I went to a meeting at South Orange on Sunday night. I can't tell you who was there. I can't tell you what they said. I don't know. But I came home, undressed, went to bed, laid down, and miracle of miracles, I went right to sleep. And I wakened the next morning with a firm resolve, I thought, to leave. And I sat up on the side of the bed, and I thought, gee, I had a good night's sleep. The first night I'd had in eight months, I couldn't understand it. But I was sleeping, and sleeping beautiful. And something else had happened. That God that I wouldn't mention, that name that I wouldn't mention, had taken from me the desire to run away, the desire to drink, the desire to take drugs. And from that day to this, it has never returned. That, my friends, is a miracle. In going to AA, I informed them that I didn't believe in God. The one the old timers said, Do you believe in good orderly direction? Yeah. That's what it is. God has a real sense of humor because I married a couple of years after I was an AA and added a, a D to my name and my initials are G-O-D. <laughs> uh, I told you God had a sense of humor. Um, and the, the... I never understood that for a long time what had happened to me I don't think I do now except that God had something in line for me to do and that's over 42 years ago it seems like yesterday if you think this has been a long journey I've got news for you every day is exciting Every day is interesting. Every day there's something new to learn. Um, I had a hard time with the 12 steps. I wanted to rewrite them, of course, but I think most everybody wanted to rewrite the book at one time or another. Uh, I, uh, I never have been smart enough to write a book as good as the AA book. Um, I thought it was terribly written. And uh, when it was first given to me, I uh, um, threw it out the window in the snowbank. Um, had a peculiar book. It had legs on it. It walked back and was on the night table that night. <laughs> then I put it in the dirty laundry going out to the laundry. 
It was back on the night table that night. And I threw it in the garbage. Came back a little greasy, but it was there. And you know, I think that greasy book was one of the reasons that God took away my desire to leave and gave me peace. Because after I came from that South Orange meeting, I opened that book. And it fell open to page 57 in the old volume. The chapter on how it works. Rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. And I was following the path of destruction. And that word honest in that first paragraph was an inch high. And I didn't like it. I knew I was dishonest. But I kept reading. Why? God's will. Not mine, because I didn't want to. I promise you I didn't want to. But I kept on reading. And when I came to the 12 steps, instead of reading them as we... For some reason or other, I transposed that into I admit that I am powerless over alcohol and that my life is unmanageable. I'd been saying we was you, not me. And as I went through this in the first person, I assumed something was happened, but I didn't realize this. In retrospect, I saw it, but I didn't see it at the time. But I must apply these steps to me, whether you do it or not. Going to meetings and having you doing the same thing makes it much easier, but I can sit right in the middle of you and be a thorn in my own side if I don't believe and apply what you say to me. And I began to go to meetings in earnest. And then about two years later, I married in AA. Now I'm sure some of you are going to say if I was married to an alcoholic it would be better. I've got news for you. Girls, a man is a man is a man. (laughs) And a marriage is a marriage is a marriage. And you do your part and leave the guy do his. Because men and women do not think alike, thank God. Um, I married a 50-year-old bachelor, 10 years older than I was, Roman Catholic, never married, came complete with aged mother as a package. (laughs) I'm a hard shell Baptist, divorced, and queer, and I fit in that family like a bee in an anthill. (laughs) But strange things happen even with Irish mothers. She went nuts before she died. She turned around to one of her sons who was visiting her and driving about 75 miles each way every day. She looked at him and says, why don't you be like Jerry? Says, she comes to see me once every few weeks because she wants to. You come every day because you have to. And you know, don't depend upon these old birds being crazy. I'm older than she is now. Grandma made it rough, and the going wasn't easy. The girls looked at that handsome Irishman, and I said, you can look, girls, but don't touch. I paid three bucks for him. What I'm trying to tell you is 
the sense of humor I got after I got into AA because I didn't have one before has let me live and laugh at me because I'm the stupidest, funniest thing in the world and I just mess up my own life. You know, my mother's drinking didn't make me drink. Verna kept on drinking. Somebody said, how do you know she was an alcoholic? Well, I'll tell you one way. When the mother calls, collect, at 3 o'clock in the morning to tell you she has cataracts, and I said, Mother, why didn't you call earlier? She very indignantly replied, I was asleep. (laughs) And if you think that is an alcoholic, I'll eat it. (laughs) Verna never got well, unfortunately. But my brother stayed well until his death. My husband, I have to tell you something I don't want to tell you, but I do it for a reason, because I find some of the people in AA, the so-called old-timers, 15, 20 years, objecting to people with drugs. Yet Dr. Bob put everybody in the hospital because he thought everybody was taking heroin, he was. Bill took more pills than I ever did. Of course, he didn't have the long hair that I had, and I rolled it up in a curl in a hairnet when I went into the hospital so I wouldn't run out. And they could never figure out why they couldn't get me clean. (laughs) (laughs) They even went so far as to do a rectal and a vaginal on me looking for pills. Can you imagine those poor doctors and nurses looking for those pills? There they were, right in my hair. (laughs) For God's sake, don't turn kids away because they say they're druggies. Little kid came in my office the other day, and incidentally, I'm in the rehab field now. And he said, I'm not a, an alky, I'm a druggie. I said, well, you do drink, don't you? He said, well, not much. How much? A couple of six packs a day and a couple of shots. I said, you'll do until Rummy comes along. <laughs> uh, I have had, through my rehab, better than 15,000 people And I've seen thousands more in consultation. I have yet to see an alcoholic who didn't take drugs. Their definition of drugs is something I'm not taking. If it's over the counter, if the doctor gave it to me, if it's something new, it isn't a drug. Alcohol is the oldest known drug of addiction, my friends. I have yet to see a druggie who doesn't drink. They prefer maybe something else. The one, because the illegal drug was alcohol, I wanted alcohol. They've got something else that's illegal now, and that's what they want, but they drink like fishes. The whole bunch of them. Don't turn them away. You folks, if you so-called old-timers, turn them away. I hope your grandkids come to AA and are turned away and you fall to your knees and beg God to forgive you for being a hypocrite. My husband was not a pill taker. Never even as much as took an aspirin. He was a great big tough construction man. Rough and tough. He, the one that come in looked like he'd been in the gutter for a week. Fifteen minutes later, he looked like he came out of Brooks Brothers. He was so handsome. And I'd tell the girls, you can look, girls, but don't touch. I paid three bucks for him, and they didn't. Uh, they were afraid of me. Uh, <laughs> but Tom hurt his back. He'd been sober 20 years. He'd been head of Intergroup in New Jersey. He'd done everything under the native sun. And Tom hurt his back. And a friend gave him 
some muscle relaxants and said, don't tell Jerry she's a nut on those things. And he didn't. And it helped his back. And this same guy gave him some new cough medicine for his cigarette cough. Didn't have any alcohol in it. It had triple bromide in it. Most of you folks in this room don't even know what triple bromide is. Two days later, after 20 years of good sobriety, that wonderful husband of mine was in a bar. And he went, was in 14 hospitals in 17 months, and he never could get sober again. God forbid that it'll happen to any of you folks, ever. Please, God, take care of you. Question everything. There are times when you will have to have something. But know that you're in jeopardy and keep yourself surrounded by good AA people. There is nothing that will take the place of AA. And all of these other things that have formed, and I spoke recently at a cocaine convention, have been formed because they have been turned away from some AA group. Please, God, don't let it be your kids. It's the same program. Don't take drugs, including the alcohol drug. Go to meetings and shut up and listen. It's still the same thing. Look at yourself. You are the problem. I think one of the things I thought I'd tell you a little bit about um, the things that gave me um, trouble. I want all of you alcoholics in this room to remember if there hadn't been a Lois Wilson, there wouldn't have been an AA. And I didn't like the film the other night because Lois was the sweetest, mildest woman that ever lived and put up with more trash than you can understand. It made it look like she had a posh job at Macy's and she was working in the basement. It made it look like they had a posh apartment and they were living in a basement apartment in Brooklyn. That's why they spent the summer weekends with my brother in the mountains. They were a hard-working couple. And they worked as a couple. And they were wonderful, wonderful people. Don't ever forget them in your prayers. Because without them, you and I wouldn't be here or any place else. I think the thing that I fought the most was definitions in AA. I could say, not me, not me. I said, I didn't have a disease. In the first place, the alcohol ick is that ick on the end that bothers the alcohol is fine but when you put an ick on the end of it <laughs> you feel icky <laughs> and I didn't like the word alcohol there was a time when they were going to call it Jelinek's disease after the great Dr. Jelinek we called him Bunky he was about this high and he debunked so much stuff and they were going to call it Jelinek's disease wouldn't it be wonderful to go to Jelinek's therapy uh, instead of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, that's what I thought in those days. I'm grateful that I'm an alcoholic today. And I want to keep on being an alcoholic who isn't drinking, who's a member of AA, who will fight for it any time, any place. But uh, had they called it something else, a disease is actually only an altered function of the body or mind. And let me tell you something. Alcohol alters the function of everybody's body and mind, and I don't care whether it's one drink or 101. With us, if it did for everybody what it does for me, they'd all be drunks, honey, because I dance divinely, and I have a birth injury, and I have one foot that goes off to the side and forgets to come back. And uh, 
Uh, so I don't dance very divinely, but uh, drunk I did. It did so much for me. I was tall and beautiful. I didn't have quick and crooked nose and big ears and all the stuff that I had. But I, um, I just didn't like the ick. That was the thing. And I didn't, I certainly wasn't addicted. You know that. Addiction is a dirty word. You know what addiction really is? Pain plus a learned relief. And you better become addicted to AA. You better become so addicted that the only place you can find for your pain is in an AA meeting and with AA people. And I urge all of you to have six day numbers and six night numbers. They might not be the same. And after you've dialed 12 numbers and nobody answers, honey, you'll be so mad at the telephone company, you'll jerk the telephone off the wall and forget what made you mad. Because <laughs> they're to blame for your problem. You know that. Uh, we've got to do the little things. Take the body to the meeting. I'd, they say, well, I never hear anything I want to hear. What do you go for to hear the people pleasers? All they said to me was, shut up. Shut up. You don't have a way. And I am addicted to AA. Some of you are addicted to food. Look out. You know, uh, it isn't the original cost. It's the upkeep of going like this. Uh, <laughs> seriously, for your nerves, I hope you uh, watch your diet. A high protein, high vitamin, low starch, low sugar diet will make you feel better. They told me that very early in the beginning and I said, I know about diet. I graduated in nutrition and I went from 108 pounds to 181 in nothing flat. <laughs> to me with a wrap around clothes belly sticking out. 39 years old. Going on 40. Uh-oh. I, some of you are going to be using your fingers. I'm 82 years old. I'm headed towards 83. I'm still working seven days a week. That's right. I can outwork most of you right down to the and I asked some of my staff if they wouldn't like my job. One of them said, for $5 million a year, I wouldn't take this for anything in the world. I'm geared now to the reluctant to recover. Anybody reluctant to recover here? I don't want any. I got too many now. Uh, I had jumped over the word God um, along the way. But I hadn't lost the hate of the word humility. And you know what humility is? A real understanding of what we're worth. And that little sergeant started me on humility by saying, shut up, you don't have a way. These things, I said, well, easy does it, how come? Somebody said, you just can't see the fine print. You need your eyes examined. It says, easy does it, but do it the easy way. And do it today and every day. Don't drink, dummy. <laughs> That's what they were telling me. Oh, they were real gentle with me. You see, there weren't very many women in the organization and the gal that came to see me had been sober not quite three months. She's just getting out of the hospital now. She was quite young then. She went over and told her husband, I've never been asked to see anybody before. Why did they send me to see somebody hopeless? <laughs> <laughs> so humility is a real understanding of what we're worth. And you know something? We're important in God's sight or we wouldn't be here. If you think our great, big, beautiful brain uh, kept us alive, I got news for you. 
And you folks I've noticed in the countdown of the numbers of years, are you still doing a written inventory once a year? I am full scale. And I find out the oddest things. I spend two weeks of my vacation doing a written inventory of myself. And I go to an interested but unaffected party. Sponsors know me too well, and they may know you too well. Before I go to this interested but unaffected party to say out loud what I believe to be true, I go in the bathroom and I read this to myself in the mirror. And you'd be surprised how stupid you feel lying to yourself. <laughs> I recommend this for you, for your fifth step. Stand there and read it so you can see your eyes. Then all of a sudden that smile on your face goes, I don't believe I wrote that. But you did. But I urge you. Now you're not going to find the same thing in your fifth step that you found when you first came in. But life is changing if you're growing. And you need to be sure that you're on the right track. You know, flattery is a tough thing to take, and you better take it by the tip of a teaspoonful, or you'll choke yourself to death if you take a teaspoonful at a time. Uh, flattery, as you get older, oh, you do such a wonderful job. Oh, thank you so much. Knock it off. Did you or didn't you? Were you honest or weren't you honest? Um... I um, got all screwed up about uh, religion, as I told you, and uh, um, having married a Roman Catholic, I took 17 weeks under one of the bishops. He said, I hope I made you a good Catholic, Jerry, and I said, you haven't. He said, I'd rather have you nothing than a poor Catholic, and we were friends until he died, and I hope he's going to be there when I get in, because you know the story of the two drunks that had an accident and they woke up and were surprised to find themselves at the pearly gates and uh, they swung open and they looked down and they saw the long golden streets and the golden sidewalks and the golden gutters and down at the end is a bar sign going wink, 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 wink. They both felt in their pockets, remember to put a quarter in the corpse's pocket, but uh, <laughs> they didn't have a dime. Well, they thought they'd go down there and look in anyway and they went down, there's a long golden bar and a beautiful barmaid behind the bar with a halo over her head and they went in and they sat down and she said, what do you have to drink, boys? And they said, well, we're new. We don't have any money. And uh, she said, oh, you are new. Everything is free in heaven. And so they drank up a storm for three days and three nights and then they were so sick they thought they'd die. And they're sitting out on the golden curbstone thrown up in the golden gutter and along comes St. Peter. And uh, um, one of them said, hey, Pete, uh, I got a hangover. Send us down to hell for about a week, will you? He shook his head and said, uh, no, no, I can't do that. The other one said, uh, hey, how about two and a half days? I think it, that'd be better than none. St. Peter said, no, nope, can't do it. The first one said, how about a day and a half? Peter said, I told you, I can't do it. The first one said, why are you so arbitrary, said Peter. He said, you're so new, I hate to tell you the truth. There isn't any other place. You've got to get over your hangover right here. And this is where you get over your hangover in AA. One day at a time with nothing to bear. Hospitals aren't going to hurt. I'm a treating person, yeah. And there are some people that can't get well any other way. But if you can go direct to AA, you better do it. And if you're in a treatment center, you better go to AA right after it or you're going to die. There are no magic cures, but this is a way of life that people will show you the way and hold your hand. Come on, I will show you the way. And that's the only thing there is. As there, you remember at the first I began to fight God. And they said... The old timer said, what about good orderly direction? And that wasn't so bad. 
And then later, I became oriented and happy, but I had religion and spirituality all screwed up. And you know something, the drunk monk, I don't know how many of you know this particular drunk monk, there are several of them, but uh, this one builds himself as the drunk monk. And uh, I said, Justin, what in the world is the matter with me? I can't get this spirituality business straightened out. He said, Jerry, do you have a set of standards that you try to live by? A set of standards that you think the God of your understanding might possibly accept if you were called today? And I said, yeah, I've got a set of standards. Don't lie. Try to be honest. Don't drink. Don't take drugs. Try to help others. And I went through a whole list of them. He said, that is all spirituality is, a set of standards that you try to live by. Religion is a dogma, the way you set your table for your God, and it doesn't make any difference. You do it your way. If you find your table set best in one church, go to that church. You know I'm comfortable now whether it's Catholic, Presbyterian, you name it, Jewish synagogue. We have lots of Jewish patients now that we didn't used to have. And you know, we must realize that they need help. And they don't understand us any more than we understand them. And their, quote, religion. They are human beings. They are people. All of us are God's children. And he wants us to be well. You know, I'm grateful to Al-Anon. There are a lot of Al-Anon people here. Because Lois saved my life so many times. And 27 years ago, I started a men's Al-Anon, and if any of you have wives in AA and you don't know what to do with yourself, start a men's Al-Anon. 27 years later, it's still going, and they're having a wonderful time. I talked to them recently. There are ways to get around things if we try. Don't let the new words that you're hearing now scare you off of AA, which says, don't drink. Don't drug, go to meetings, and shut up. Every time I hear about a dysfunctional family, I almost throw up. <laughs> and I asked one young man to write out what a dysfunctional family was. I said, sit right down there at that table and write out what a dysfunctional family is. You know what a dysfunctional family is? One that doesn't do it his way. That's what a dysfunctional family is. If your kids say that you're dysfunctional, say, yeah, and I'm not going to do it your way either. And this codependency. If you aren't dependent on another human being, you've got real trouble. You've got real trouble. If you think you're God, you've got trouble. And there's no sense in the world of this business. You say, but I can't get any wisdom. And the wisdom to know the difference. You know what wisdom is? Common sense developed to an uncommon degree, and this whole room is full of wisdom. Because you've all developed something to take home to you. Things have gone on over the years that are different, are they better? I don't know. Does it make any difference? I'm sober. I'm happy. I'm functional, by the way. <laughs> I work. I raised a stepson. 
He gave me my philosophy in life. When he stayed with me and I asked him why when Pop was so generous and gave him everything that money could buy and I was so strict because I believe we should have a set of standards for ourselves and that we give to our people that we try to help whether it's our own children or another alcoholic or what it is. And I said when this, his father and I got a divorce he came to live with me after going to the judge to be assigned. And I said, Dick, Pop was so generous with you, he gave you everything that money could buy. And I'm so strict. Why did you want to stay with me? He said, Mom, you love me enough to make me behave. If you have your own standards in line, my friends, and pass them on to your children while they may say, I hate you, they don't mean it. One mother said, I don't want my son to be an addict. I don't want him to be alcoholic. I don't want him to be a druggie. And I had to simply tell her, well, we have some other long-term diseases. We have uh, cancer and heart disease and syphilis. And we have some AIDS. Would you like any of those instead? <laughs> To which she replied, I want my son perfect. Look at yourself, is that what your, what are your standards of perfection for you and perfection for them? You know, there's so many things that I have learned. I was an intellectual idiot when I came to AA. I'm a functional alcoholic who loves every day, who can laugh at herself, who enjoys living, and enjoys this group more than you'll ever know. Because you are my people. You are the thing that makes me live. And I said a prayer for you today. And I know God must have heard it. I felt the answer in my heart although he spoke no word. I didn't ask for wealth or fame, and I knew you wouldn't mind. I asked him to send treasures of a far more lasting kind. I asked that he be near you at the start of every new day to grant you help and blessing and friends to share your way. I asked for happiness for you in all things great and small, but it was for his loving care that I prayed for most of all. And in your prayers, my friend, keep it simple. We used to say, kiss a lot, keep it simple, stupid. I prefer now to say, keep it simple, spiritually. Have a set of standards that you can live by. And in your prayers at night, my friend, don't complicate it for God or for yourself. I have learned that the simpler it is, the better I can do it. It was hard for me to learn to say thank you. Just a simple thank you for today. And in the morning, to say, God, I need your help. I'll try harder. And each night, I ask God to take my hand. It's better that way, I know. Because if I take his, instead of his taking mine, I may get afraid and let go. May God bless this group, keep it going many more years, and doing a great and beautiful job that I see in your faces. It shows. I love you all. God bless you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.